Welcome. If you're just joining us, the live hangout will start in a few moments. Yeah, I'm here, Carly. Great. Okay, well, we're going to get started here. Welcome to our live hangout from Research Vessel Falcor. I'm Carly Weiner, the Communications Manager for Schmidt Ocean Institute, and we are so excited to be talking with ROV Sebastian engineering team today, specifically David Witherspoon, our lead manager for ROV Sebastian. Welcome, David. Hi, Carly. How are you? Good, good. We're really, really excited that you made some time to talk to us today about ROV Sebastian. It's been a very exciting few weeks, and uh, we can't wait to get some questions. So please, for those of you that are joining us online, feel free to tweet your questions or submit your questions. We have Logan here who's going to be taking them. For those of you who have not been following the excitement, our ROV engineering team has designed and built a brand new remotely operated vehicle, Sebastian, for science use on Falcor. They've done this in a truly amazing timeline, and in April, the vehicle got wet at the Mumbari tank testing facility for the first time. After two weeks of successful testing, it was shipped to meet Falcor in Guam. On July 1st, we have begun with mobilization and bringing Sebastian onto Falcor, and within a few days, the team was beginning to integrate Sebastian to the ship. After several weeks of, uh, or several days of integration, we completed our first ocean dive on July 24th, and this past Friday completed our target dive of 4,500 meters. For the next half hour, we'll learn about how the team completed this and how the dives are going, and what's next for Sebastian. So again, please submit your questions via Twitter, YouTube, or Google Hangouts. So David, first, uh, I'd love to start by just talking a little bit about Sebastian. Walk us through this ROV. So thanks, Carly. Well, first of all, um, I can't see anybody on the call, but I'm sure there's plenty of people there. Um, so what about Sebastian? If some of you have been following us, the last time we talked on Google Hangouts was back in the factory when we were feverishly uh, putting Sebastian together. Um, we just had Sebastian and a few bits of its ancils. So in the past, sort of since the 1st of July, we first of all mobilized the system out of uh, Hayward uh, in California and then got it down into Guam, which took us about three or four weeks to get the equipment here. Uh, at the same time, we had equipment come from Denmark, some from UK, uh, some from Australia. Uh, so we had a piece of equipment popping up everywhere, as well as the manpower to operate. So we have an engineering team. Uh, but we also have to supplement that engineering team with operators. Um, and it took us about two or three weeks because we took the time. We, 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 you know, we didn't rush the integration of Sebastian onto a uh, Falcor. And that included bringing a complete new winch system onto Falcor and doing all the mechanical modifications for that, then adding all the electronic control systems for the winch and the control systems for um, the Sebastian itself. And then getting all of those pieces of equipment to talk to each other is the most important. And if there's software engineers out there, uh, you'll, um, you'll get an understanding that these things talk to each other by zeros and ones. So it's pretty complicated integrating the system onto Falcor as well as taking Falcor's system into the vehicle. So let's start from the very beginning. I mean, Sebastian is a very compact, compact vehicle, but still 6,500 pounds. How did you get everything on Falcor in the first place? Uh, so, so getting the equipment on Falcor was not so much of a challenge. We use a lot of heavy lifting equipment, which is you know, commercially available at a lot of container ports. Um, so we tend to use a lot of equipment rather than bringing it on. So um, when you look at the different videos of uh, Falcor that uh, Carly has provided over the last week, you'll see that the system is actually spread throughout Falcor. It's not concentrated in one area. Um, it's now integrated so much that it's an integral part of the ship's subsystems. So um, getting it on board wasn't too difficult. Getting it to work was painfully painstaking. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the integration process. So you had the vehicle on Falcor, and then what specifically did you do so that the ship and the vehicle could talk to each other? 
Well, we modularized the system so that we'd have least impact on fall calls um, infrastructure. Um, but with this necessary components that we have to have, we have to have a lot of the feeds that Falkor has for GPS, from lats longs. Um, we also have to have power from Falkor, and we're pulling 390 volts, 60 amps into the actual system, and we're converting that to 450 volts, 9 amps, um, to allow us to run the vehicle. Then we put the actual winch onto the actual uh, uh, Falkor itself, and to do that, it's not a case of just placing her on the deck. We have to do structural modifications to the ship to support a 26-ton uh, winch system. And then we have all the controls for those winches, which are in three different spots. We have them by the winch, down on the aft deck by Sebastian, and we have them in the control room so we can up-winch from any of those points. Um, at the same time, we it off all those systems into Falkor's repositories. Um, so not a particularly easy task. And then systematically going through each of those subsystems to ensure that they talk to each other, they're providing the right data, and when we ask it to do a control function, it actually does what we ask it to do. Um, so, slow, slow, painful task. Well, it's uh, hard work, but it's obviously paid off because you've had uh, quite a few successful dives so far. Tell us what's been going on, the, I guess, the last three or four days with the dives that you've been doing. Yeah, so basically our first system is power, it's thrusters, um, and it's basic hydraulic functions so that we can slowly increase the depth and get the basic vehicle down to its design depth of 4,500 meters. And we did that um, a few days ago um, successfully and we had you know, minimal issues with it. Um, and at the same time, identifying those problems that are going to manifest themselves into bigger problems in the future, and therefore, you know, repairing and modifying those subsystems before we add scientific equipment to the to the vehicle. So we we modified a lot of those systems to make sure that uh, we won't have any of these recurring problems. And slowly, we're now adding to it this the core science equipment that's its coras, its bio boxes, you know, fine tuning its manipulators, fine tuning the data products that coming off them. and again that's the slow iterative process and we learn more each fasting as we you know, it's like a new child it's growing up it was crawling it's walking and now we're about to take it you know where it's um, pretty much running um, yeah so we, we're just dialing the system in now excellent uh, that's good to hear so we have one question here how is a remotely operated vehicle attached to the ship yeah, so it's you know it's permanently attached to the ship. So we have a, a 5,590 millimeter armored umbilical with a multiple you know five conductors in it, five fibers and a single mode fiber drain wire. So so it's it's quite a compact structure. You know the breaking um, strength of that is about 220 kilonewtons or two you know 22 tons. Um, and Falker weighs about, that's the winch there, so you can see the wraps on the right. Um, so that's 90 millimeters thick, it looks a lot thicker than that. Um, and that's what actually connects the vehicle permanently to the ship. So we mechanically terminate the vehicle, and we then drive the vehicle down and we pay out that steel wire rope behind it. And in the core of it is all of our conductors and our data transfer mediums. Excellent. And we have another question here. What emergency uh, systems are in place for Sebastian? Or recovery? Yeah, so we have a number of we have a number of systems that we've been testing. So if we have a uh, a damaged umbilical, uh, so if I split the umbilical or if I damage the armor, then we use the system of recovery using uh, uh, grips, and we basically grip it, and we use the two cranes that we have on the ship to basically pull it in a bit, we'll lock her off, pull her in. Um, and if the vehicle also, if she's on the surface and we can't lift it with the crane, we have an emergency lift point uh, where we can lift the vehicle using one of our cranes, 301. Um, and we also have emergency recovery systems on the winch, so if we have a dead power scenario on the ship or a brownout, that we can still provide power to the winch, allows us to slowly recover Sebastian. Or if Sebastian is dead, I just lost all of her uh, communications and power. We just slowly wind her in like a, an oversized fish until um, we get to a point where we can lift her back up into the docking head and mechanically mate her to the ship. 
Well, we hope we never have to do that. Um, but you talked a lot about the umbilical system, which I think is a, just a fantastic and really cool system that you guys have put in place here with the floats. Um, maybe you could point to the back uh, or the aft deck and show some of the floats and how you deploy and recover uh, Sebastian off the ship. Yeah, so Sebastian, she's a, uh, a free-flying vehicle. Um, and what I mean by that is that we have the wire permanently attached to the vehicle, unlike commercial systems where it comes down on a, a cage or tether management system, and then when it gets to depth, the vehicle will fly away on a, you know, a flyaway lead uh, away from its cage. We have a free flyer here, which basically means if you imagine our umbilical goes into the water and at a certain point we'll start to attach these catenary floats, that's the big yellow floats you can see on the right hand side of that picture and it suspends the wire above Sebastian so the wire will come straight off Sebastian into two floats and then we'll create effectively this big yes bend in the wire by adding floats at different points what that allows us to do is manage the movement of the ship and Sebastian so as the ship moves around, and we create effectively, uh, you know, an underwater spring, so that the ship are constantly moving, um, supported by those catenary floats. And that's the catenary floats there, um, and then that that allows us then to prevent the wire dragging on the seabed or too much wire being in the water um, that uh, ends up following Sebastian or taking Sebastian deeper than we want it to go. So, you know, a reasonably complex system. It's all about maths and placement of those floats and then controlling of the system from Falkor, you know, understanding how much wires in the water, what the depth of um, the vehicle is and how far away from the ship she is. And then we can manage what we colloquially call that delta, which is the S-band that we have in the water created by those floats. Um, so we're basically suspending the floats of those, uh, sorry, the cable with those catenary floats. Excellent. Thanks, David. We have another question here. How many, how, sorry, how much data can Sebastian tra transmit and will live streaming be available? So, wow, yeah, that's, that's a pretty question. So she got five single mode fibers uh, that she can, you know, uh, you know, churn a lot of data up. I'm not sure what the data passes medium is. I've got Nick right next to me who'll probably be able to tell me. Um, and live streaming from the vehicle, it's not the vehicle that we're concerned about because we can get the data to the surface reasonably quickly, you know, speed of light effectively. It's from the ship to shore, which will affect in that link between the ship and the base station on shore that will affect our ability to live stream. But we've done it before, and I'm sure in the future, you know, Carly and Steve will, you know, will hook up a live streaming event that will, um, you know, stream from Sebastian when he's on the seabed. And just to uh, jump jump onto that, David, too, I know that our live streaming plans will begin with our first science cruise, which will take place in late November, to the Mariana Back Arc, where we'll be following up on some hydrothermal vents that we discovered last year. And like uh, similar cruises in the past, we will always live stream to YouTube with ROV Sebastian. So we're looking forward to some of those dives. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, more the better. Excellent. So I know today you guys have a big day. You're planning a dive, and I see there's a bunch of action happening in the back. Uh, what does preparing for a dive with Sebastian entail, and, and how do you go about um, doing all your pre-checks and planning for the ROV? Well, so the, the planning for a dive happens about 24 hours in advance of the dive start. And so we, we plan to dive with the ship's captain and the ship's crew as to where we'd like to dive or, you know, normally directed by the chief scientist, but we, we're engineering at the moment. So we pretty much plan the depth of cell and we'll then identify the objectives of each of those dives. And those objectives will then dive the uh, drive the configuration of what Sebastian is on that day. So... The day before, we have the, the crew of the, the RV Falker managing the weather, the status, what they think the sea state's going to be the next day, what the currents and tides look like, so that we get a best chance of being able to get to the point that we want to go to. Um, and then the actual pre-diving will start the night before, where we'll then integrate the instruments and we'll check the instruments. We normally try and finish about 30, 9 o'clock in the evening. The crew will get some rest. Uh, we'll be up at 5.30 in the morning, and then we'll continue to do those pre-dive checks. Now, we're getting quicker at them, but at the same time, we're still very diligent. So she's a new vehicle. It's like a new car. We've got to run her in. You know, things get loose. 
Um, so we take much longer to do that pre-dive than than will happen most probably in you know a year, eighteen months time, and then it'll take us to about nine o'clock, and then go back, rebrief on the weather, then go back out, do our final checks on Sebastian, and then we'll pick him up and you know, basically stick him in the water, and he'll head off to do his next science mission. So. He's not afraid of the dark no more. He's been down the deep parts. His lights work, his cameras work, and he's, he's pretty comfortable. Now, I had the pleasure of being on Falkor with you not too long ago, and you talk about uh, some amazing lighting systems and video systems. Can you talk about those? Because I know Sam, the systems engineer, uh, provided me with a very interesting fact about the lighting on Falkor. Yeah, so, I mean, we have... We've got a lot of lights on Falkor. You know, it's one of the uh, biggest drivers for a lot of the power consumption on the vehicle is the lights. Um, in that we have, you know, so many of them and they're so big um, that, you know, currently if we turn all the lights on, we have about 150 uh, cars worth of main beam illuminating the seabed at any one time. So 150 cars who are on main beam is the, the amount of light that's coming off Sebastian. But we have to deal with that light. That that light can be really problematic for us because we get a lot of, you know, back scatter. We get a lot of reflections of the seabed. We get shadowing off the vehicle, and so we have to manage that light. And so you can probably see a couple of holes there. One of the lights is missing. We're currently moving them around um, to identify which is the best placement to give us the best lighting structure for our cameras to capture those pictures. So it's an ending tooth. Each science mission it changes with each, uh, what the turbidity of the water looks like. Um, yeah, so it's you know, but without lights and cameras, it's a blind vehicle. And you know, I think you made a really good point there, where you're saying you know you tried the lights and they were a little bright with backscatter, so you're moving the lights around. I think what's that's one of the amazing things about this team is there's a lot of problem solving, and you guys right now through the sea trials have been working through. Um, different processes. How how has that been working with the team and, and and running through these problems and troubleshooting as you go along? Well, I mean the the team itself is a pretty structured little beast. You know, it's five or six of us that have been working on the vehicle system for over eighteen months. Um, but when you come onto the ship Falco, you get access to you know, a different level of operational experience. Well, you think you've designed, when you come onto a Falker, you realize that you may have designed around it. But the experience that's on Falker, plus the rest of the um, operational guys that we've brought on, you know, we've got three contracted op ops guys here. You know, and it's like, you know, a, a colloquial period is like climbing Everest. And you get to the oxygen depletion zone and you're pretty tired. And you need those really experienced Sherpas to come along and pull you that last you know, a couple of hundred meters up to the, 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 the summit of Everest. And that's where we are. Design the vehicle. We know how it works. But to get us over that final line, we need to then start integrating with the ship. And the ship helps us pull the system along to a point where it becomes pretty successful. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's not one person solving these problems. It's a group of people sitting down and discussing the, discussing the issue, managing each of those um, comments and eventually coming up with a, you know, a, a collective um, answer to how we solve some of these problems. And so far, touch with it's worked particularly well. Excellent. We have a, another question from Twitter here. What motivated the team members to choose building ROVs and ocean exploration as a career? Um, I think, you know, I can't talk for all of them, but I can certainly talk for some of them. Um, I think some of us fell into it by accident. Um, you know, through different mediums that, that drive you here. But I think the common part to everybody, including the crew of Falker, is that we care about the ocean. Um, and we only work on this, and as most of my guys will say, is they're here because they want to be here. It's not because they have to be here. Um, and, and, and it's that caring about the ocean. If you have a drive to care about something, eventually you'll find a means in which to, um, you know, you know, drive that that sort of like want to a point where you're either working on the ocean or you're supporting the ocean. So everybody that's on Falco right now has a one similar key thread, which is they, they care about the ocean, they care about ocean sciences, and they care about collecting that data that's super important for our, you know, our academics to understand, you know, what what's happening to the ocean, what damage we're doing to the ocean, and how we can repair the ocean if we can. Excellent. And another question came in, uh, why Guam is a location for the first sea trials for the ROV? 
Uh, well, what, there's two reasons. It's opportunity. So um, 15 months ago when we started planning the vehicle system, we worked out when we think we'd have the vehicle finished and where Falco was geographically in the world. And she was working this location um, in and around Vietnam. So therefore, um, Guam seemed like a suitable place for us to um, basically integrate the equipment, take a dive, and plus right on the back door of Guam, we're in the Pacific here, we're normally very lucky with the sea conditions and we can get the depth that we wanted um, just 30 or 40 nautical miles off the coast of Guam. So we don't have big transits like if we were in Honolulu, we have some big transits to get some of those test dive depths, whereas here it's right on our doorstep, plus the the uh, the sea creatures and the uh, volcanoes that we're seeing on our dives at the moment are just truly amazing. And what that does is it allows us, because of the water clarity and the sea conditions, to dial the system in so much faster. Excellent. Yeah. And I'd also add that the community has been very receptive and wonderful to work with. We've had a lot of fun doing some outreach events with Sebastian in Guam um, before the sea trials. That's correct. Yeah, they've been great. So I see behind you, uh, is that Jason in the control room or someone from the team is in the control room? And to me, that's one of the most uh, interesting and kind of places where a lot of the action happens during a dive. Can you walk us through a little bit about what happens in the control room and how that control room connects to uh, Sebastian? Yeah, so if you if you think of the control room as if you sat inside of Sebastian and you're looking through a porthole, you want to get as much of the peripheral vision that you have on Sebastian and the data products that Sebastian's are producing at your fingertips. Um, so what we're seeing there is Dan, he's our supervisor for today's dive, uh, managing the actual control room and going through some of those pre-dive checks. Um, so there's probably four evolutions for um, a dive of this nature. There's actually five, but there's you know, four we're concerned about. That's the pre-dive where we check all the subsystems, we'll run them on the deck, and all of that's controlled from the control room. So those who saw Sebastian back in Hayward, we were controlling the system through a laptop. Um, now we're actually controlling the system through its pilot and co-pilot consoles, which you can see two in front of Dan. Um, he also has control over a number of ship systems, so he, he can talk directly to the bridge from this point, you know, and ask the ship to move to a position where he gets a better feel for where Sebastian is. He can also control the winch from this point here, and you can see those controllers above the screen. He can also uh, control our power distribution unit. So once we have launched the vehicle and we've got the vehicle to a safe depth, um, we effectively hand over control of all of those subsystems to the control room. And then they become the nerve center for all of the activities, that's all the filming, all the diving, all the data retrieval. Um, and so managing um, those multiple tasks comes down to a pilot, co-pilot, a supervisor, and a navigator. And so it's pretty, it's pretty intense in there while we're launching. Um, gets a little bit quiet while she's descending to depth. We're just monitoring systems for safety and uh, integrity. And then when we get to the, closer to the seabed, then you'll see that the activity picks up because uh, now those um, operators are starting to get to work and Sebastian um, starts to do what she's designed to do. So, the, so everything is controlled from that control room. So once we hand over, we have no control of the vehicle uh, on, on the back deck. Uh, it's all done by the control room. So what you see now is Dan, I can hear him on the radio. He's actually doing some subsystems check with Jason, who's... Um, uh, currently running the deck this morning to make sure that the vehicle's doing exactly what Dan wants it to do in this dry state. And that's so amazing uh, to just watch how you guys talk to each other and coordinate the dive between the back deck and the control room and uh, watch it all happen. So what's the plan for the dive today? I know that you're going to be diving Sebastian uh, pretty soon after this call. Yeah, so you're right. We have our own little language set in there, and it's it's very cryptic, but it's you know it's an, a language that eventually everyone understands when you work on ROVs. Um, so when we finish this call today, um, we'll pick Sebastian up. We have her in the position that we have her now, so you can see the front of the vehicle. But ordinarily, she will be launched, and she will be this morning with her manipulators facing forward. So when we when we touch the ocean, we'll engage her, her thrusters, um, and then we'll drive the vehicle away from. Falker uh, while we do the necessary connection of the floats. And you can see now we're starting to add some instruments. Um, 
And yesterday we added some coros. Um, we've got some bio boxes on there for collecting rock samples, and we're just perfecting how those systems work with Falcor. Uh, sorry, with uh, Sebastian. And you can see that big blue hose that's running down um, the side of Sebastian. That's effectively an underwater vacuum in which we can vacuum small creatures or sand up into uh, containment jars. You can see those white containment jars there, commonly known as the suction sampler. Uh, and we're just perfecting that over the last couple of days. We're making sure we get the right water flow, we get the right pressures, we know where the switches are, um, uh, and then configuring it to different parts of the vehicle. So although she's on the front uh, starboard side at the moment, uh, we'll put it on all four corners so we work out which is the best position for the vehicle uh, to have that piece of equipment. And I see behind she's you... She's going off to... <laughs> Sorry, the top right there, the interface, um, can you talk us through a little bit about that and is that what you're looking at during the dive? Yeah, so on this screen up on the top right, you're talking about this is the user and co-pilot and the navigator also as an instance of this uh, same screen. And, and each of them are looking at different things. So the pilot who's flying the vehicle is nominally looking at his depths, his heading, what his auto uh, functions are doing, and the co-pilot is managing on the left there. You have all the winch there, so we know what the payout of the winch is, um, what the winch is doing, and at the same time, the navigator is looking at your position relevant to the, um, and your position relevant to where you want to go to on the seabed. Um, and the screen that we see now is one of the sub pages of it, where we can constantly go through each of those subsystems, turning systems on and checking, you know, what the signal mapping looks like. So um, on that screen, you'll see all the tabs along the top. You know, it's pretty complex. Each of those has different functions, and each of those have different diagnostics that we can, you know, reset sub C, or we can fault find sub C. If we get a ground fault, we can switch them off and isolate them, etc. So it's it's um, three three people, um, you know, managing the, you know this multi-million dollar vehicle through. Um, a couple of thousand dollar uh, laptop screen, effectively, you know, or iPad. Yeah, so that's basically, and you can see now the guys are tuning one of the cameras. It's got a, you know, a color problem, so they'll resolve that in the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes. Excellent. And I know um, you said you'll be testing some new instrumentation that's going on, Falkor. What have you guys tested so far in the dives? So I think now we've tested onesies and twosies of everything. So we've tested one bio box. We haven't tested the double bio boxes, but we'll do that in the next day. So we've tested one or two coras. We'll now bring it up to the packs of six and twelves. Um, we've tested the manipulators. We've now got intermeshing jaws as well as parallel jaws to make things a little bit easier for the operators. And we're starting now to allow those range of functions to take or uh, take in the whole envelope of what Sebastian can do. So if I talk about the manipulators for a second, we had those soft stops so that we had limited movement on those manipulators and all of its uh, functions. Now we're reducing those stops so that we get more functionality and we can reach further out and we can reach around to the side of uh, Sebastian as the operators and Sebastian gets used to what that system feels like underwater. Uh, and then all of our natural trim functions so we can hover above the seabed we did some work against some cliffs, which means you know cliff work is particularly onerous for a free-flying beak, um, but we can pin ourselves against a point on the cliff and analyze a specimen that may be crawling around. Um, so all of those functions, and now we're dialing them in to the point where they're super detailed and give us real dexterity with the actual system itself. And I know um, you've tried different depths. Each dive was uh, different times and different depths. Uh, are there plans to uh, continue at the same depth or go a little bit shallower or try different terrain in the next coming dives? Well, there, uh, well, the reason we vary steps is that each of those different types of depths have different challenges. So if we're shallow, we have a big challenge with the position of Falkor and the actual Sebastian vehicle. So the shallower we are, we have you know, less time to manage the ship in relative to the umbilical that's going in the water. And the deeper we are, we have additional problems in that if we want to do transit up a cliff, we've got to we can fall off the cliff rather than Falco drag us over the cliff. Um, so we're playing with all of those different depths. Plus, 
some of our functions react differently at depths when they're colder. Our oil's a little bit more, uh, the viscosity increases, they're a little bit sludgier. Um, so we're playing around with the different um, uh, types of oils that we have to make sure that we get the right oil, right depth, as well as managing the variances between some of our sensors at different depths. Shallow, they're pretty accurate. Uh, so we start to go deeper, they become calibrations off between two or three of them. We're just dialing those subsystems in right now. Excellent. And we have another question from Twitter here. Um, could you discuss the variation of Niskin bottles or sampling systems on Sebastian? And maybe tell us a little bit about the sensors that Sebastian has. Yeah, so I'll probably miss but um, if I start at the front of the vehicles, we have uh, we have a suction sampler, which has, I think it's uh, eight uh, two-liter uh, sample jars on there. Um, I think it's eight, maybe ten. Uh, but anyway, so we have a, a, a suction sampler system. We have the ability to put double bio boxes, insulated bio boxes on there, so we can maintain um, samples uh, that we collect at the you know, temperature in which we gather them, or as close to it as we gather them. We have uh, Coros, so and currently there's four on there. Um, but we can put 12 on there. Um, you can see a single bio box. Um, what else do we have? We have a temperature sensor. We have two oxygen sensors, so we can run them side by side. Uh, you can see the difference in technology. We have uh, three depth sensors. We have a, a conduct temperature sensor. Uh, what else do we have on there? Um, sound velocity probe. Uh, two 4K cameras, one being a 4K uh, pilot camera situation, the other one being a 4x10 zoom um, science scanner. Uh, we have four, four or five liter Niskin bottles that are mechanically triggered at the moment, but we'll convert them to hydraulically uh, triggered in the future. Uh, we have a, a tray at the front that extends uh, about 750 millimeters. Where else? That's right. So we have a complete science junction box that's available for scientists to plug in the different flavors of data requirements. That's totally empty at the moment. So that's uh, I think it's 12 channels for scientists. We have gigabit Ethernet ports that are available for science, so they can get their data transfer that they're after for some of their their intense instruments. Um, we have a uh, two scanning sonar, so we have a 360 scanning sonar and we have an M900 uh, forward-looking sonar that we have on a tilt so we can survey the seabed. Uh, we have a modular skid on there, so the whole bottom part of the vehicle drops off and we can put a multi-beam skid on or a um, photo mosaicing skid on. Um, and you can also see the holes that are in the um, science tray there. We can poke those photo mosaicing cameras through those holes as well. Or else. We have multiple different tooling for our manipulators at the moment. You can see the intermeshing jaws. On the other side, we have parallel jaws. Uh, we also have cutters. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm running out of things to say now. Uh, so well, she's, watching, pretty, she's pretty well kitted out. <laughs> watching the, uh, the manipulator arms move right now as they're testing them for the pre-dive, uh, the manipulator arms to me are, are one of the most impressive things about the ROV. Uh, I remember you telling me that they can hold, they can do a push-up on the aft deck if they really wanted to and hold Sebastian. Um, are the arms and, and hands interchangeable on Sebastian? Yeah, so um, and you can see the draw coming out. And that's Jason just making sure that the slide you know, comes out and goes back in. And we can dial the speed of that depending on what the scientist wants to do. And the reason that we have that draw going in is it protects all the samples on the ascend. You know, we're coming through a water column from four and a half k's down. If we don't protect those samples as best we can with that big lump of foam, uh, there's a the potential that we wash out a lot of those samples. So we, we suck it back underneath the vehicle to protect it as best we can. But going back to the manipulators, so those, both those manipulators are interchangeable. They can go on either side of the vehicle. Uh, we can also drop one minip off to give us more payload. Um, or if you want to just do a cruise where you have no manipulators, we can drop both manipulators off and give you um, a lot more payload as well as um, uh, more ability to put things like multi-beam or reason or something like that on the actual skid. Yeah, so super modular. I mean, uh, um, when I say modular, it literally is a handful of bolts to change this over. So uh, one of the questions we just got on Twitter was, uh, there's, is there a difference between the left arm and the right arm uh, of the manipulator arms? But you're saying every, everything's interchangeable on the vehicle. 
So both of those arms are exactly the same. Uh, so apart from the fact that the one which we're looking at the screen now on the left hand side has an intermeshing, uh, so it has a parallel jaw, and the one on the right hand side has an intermeshing jaw. And we changed that a couple of weeks ago, so we have an ability to grab and scoop but at the same time use our coring handles. So both exactly the same. And another question we've gotten online is. Is there a difference between using a red laser and green laser for measuring distance? And what does Sebastian have? Uh, so this was a, a question that we uh, we had to deal with a couple of times. So we've got both. So we have uh, uh, red lasers, a pair of red lasers, 10 centimeters apart. Um, we also have green. Our preference currently is green. We get better, you know, we lose that color less underwater than we seem to do with red. Uh, so we, we currently are using greens at the moment for our science camera, and then a situational camera has two reds. So we got both. You know, it's one of those things. It's a personal preference. So we try to equip the, the vehicle as best we can. We, 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 we outfitted it with both. And the cameras have also been pretty spectacular. We've posted onto social media some of that footage of the Brittle Star that you got close up the other day with the 4K camera. Have you seen any other interesting marine species while you've been testing the ROV? Yeah, and I think you're probably seeing the footage more than we are. Uh, it took us a while to dial the cameras in because they're very complex, and we're, you know, cameras are, are really they're very sensitive piece of equipment. They don't like noise, electronic noise. They don't like different environments. So to get them to work at, on the deck or in the uh, workshop is you know reasonably easy. But to get it work on on this vehicle going through you know case plus all of those um, you know muxes and demuxes is pretty is pretty intense. Um, so you know our, you know Nick and uh, Scott have been dialing those cameras in all week, and now we're starting to get some pretty good pictures out of each of those cameras. And you can see one of them now, we have it. That's the 4K situation over there. And we put a DSPL underneath it just to verify those light conditions. Uh, so we have two cameras at the same point just for testing. And from a more personal side, David, I mean, watching this vehicle go from inception to drawing to building it in such a short amount of time and now seeing Sebastian diving off of Falcor, uh, how, how is that? felt for you? Has it been rewarding? And, and what's the general sense of or feelings amongst the team right now? Um, I, you know, for us, it's been fast and furious. If you think we, we got our first engineer in April 2015, and now we have the vehicle built, plus all of the, you know, the vehicles are really a small part of the overall system. It's all the subsystems that support it on Falcor. Um, when you when you look at the amount of work those guys have done in a year, uh, just over, you know, it truly is amazing uh, to see uh, Sebastian get on the ship and pretty much touch wood, out of the box, do everything that we wanted it to do. And she's complex and she spoke because Falcons, you know, it's a ship that has some constraints and we designed around those constraints. And then for our first dive to get her, you know, our first few dives to get her in the water and get it to depth and get her to working, you know, it's pretty. You know, it's pretty amazing, you know, that she actually worked last time. We've had, you know, limited major problems when going through this. We've had lots of little problems, but no major problems thus far. That's not to say that we're not expecting them uh, and we can't deal with them. And for us, I think now now that we're seeing the, the vehicle come into the hands of the operators, we can really start to see the design being tweaked, modified, and then... You know, driven to the point where it's optimized for the job that it was designed to do, which is delivering science data. You know, so for us, you know, we, we start losing um, ownership and control of the vehicle pretty soon as we start handing off to marine operations. But uh, we're super proud of Sebastian. Hasn't let us down once. You know, really hasn't. Got into Mbari, worked how we wanted it in Mbari, and has come out here into the Pacific. Um, pretty dark, benign area, um, and has worked tremendously well. So we're pretty proud of uh, Sebastian. Well, we're looking forward to uh, following the dives and the updates. What's next for the team? Um, are there any more milestones for Sebastian? And I believe you're also going to be building a lander to go with Sebastian. Yeah, so we have, uh, uh, like I said, we have some uh, additional uh, infrastructure that uh, goes with Sebastian to make it a complete set. So we have these lander elevators that um, are you know, they can be used, you know, it's a singular lander, there's two of them, 
uh, the 5,000 meter rated to support Sebastian. Um, you know, it takes us two hours to get it down to its maximum depth. So if we can stick a couple of elevators down there, we can load the elevators up with the rocks and send them back to the surface rather than, you know, bringing Sebastian back up with, you know, its rocks and then having to send it back down. So it just makes the, the actual system, you know, more user-friendly for the scientist. He has a means of getting his rocks and samples up, you know, at the same time keeping the vehicle uh, on the seabed so long as she's, you know, fed and watered, she'll stay down there for as long as we want her to. And our final question from Twitter that just came in, uh, what modifications had to be made to Falcor in order to accommodate Sebastian? Uh, so there's a number of mods that we've had to do. You know, there was the, some of our constraints were that we couldn't modify the A-frame, uh, which, you know, some people say constraints are a pest. For us, constraints are really good because they give you direction in which you can design stuff. So um, we, we couldn't modify the A-frame at this point unless it was necessary, but we didn't have to. Uh, so we had to build that docking head. Just, uh, it's a bespoke docking head that fits fall cause frame and also deals with some of the motion of fall cost. So it's, it's pretty light, uh, has no electronics on it, it's just pneumatic, and it folds up like a pretzel and, and pins um, Sebastian uh, mechanically uh, onto that A-frame. So we get a little bit of forward and aft, uh, you know, and port and starboard sway, but it's, no, it's certainly not enough a lot. Uh, we also had to modify the top deck of uh, fall core to take that 26 inch uh, which was a significant uh, uh, mechanical modification with a lot of cutting and welding to make sure that we could uh, stick her up there. And then we have all the electronic support infrastructure that supports the winch, supports the vehicle, and the control room. Uh, we, we did our best not to do many modifications to the control room. And if you look, you can see uh, one of our, or two of our electrical engineers sat in there at the moment. Um, other than those center con. Well, it looks like we have uh, some technical difficulties. We might have just lost David here for a few minutes, but that's okay because we were about to wrap up. So I want to thank everybody to, for taking some time out uh, to join us and learn a little bit more about Sebastian. We're very excited about its integration onto Falcor and that she made uh, its first 4,500 meter dive. Uh, until then, follow us on social media channels for updates. We'll be posting every day about Sebastian. And stay tuned for more videos upcoming this month that showcase Sebastian's integration onto Falcor. Uh, don't forget to follow Schmidt Ocean Institute and Falcor as well for our next upcoming cruise in September in Vietnam, which will be our second leg there. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a wonderful day, everyone.